but you've invented a new career for yourself, in effect, which is what this book is about, Music and Mind. And it's really about how music changes the brain and actually brings people into greater happiness and can help people with diseases that get them, help them cure or, or mitigate the disease. So how did you get into this area? So I had uh, my own issues. So I had terrible stage fright from time to time in my career that was debilitating and almost really derailed me. I also had somatic pain. I had tremendous pain as a kind of a, a hedge against performance pressure. So those two things got me reading constantly about mind-body connection, trying to unpack this. And uh, I met Dr. Francis Collins at a dinner party uh, seven years ago in, in uh, Washington. And I said, hey, why are scientists studying music? You know, don't they have great things to do, like cure cancer? I mean, uh, and so, because I had noticed that there was a lot of neuroscience about, around music. And so he said, it's the brain. He said, we, we have a new brain initiative, and we want to really understand and learn more about this, the most complex object in the known universe. Uh, and music happens to activate more parts of the brain than any other activity. And it's because, it, you know, it's all, it's all in our DNA and it's all about evolution. So Dr. Francis Collins, for those who don't know, was for a long time the head of the NIH under three different presidents, which is unusual to do. He's also a musician, country music performer of Excellent. some type. And also the person who uh, discovered, uh, the co-discovered the human genome. Very, very impressive person. Um, so he um, said, okay, we'll kind of do this, but um, you point out in your book, one of the authors in your book, this book is an anthology of some of the most famous scientists and performers in, in the country, uh, in the world, uh, talking about this issue. And you point out, and one of the articles points out that uh, uh, Hippocrates in seven, I think it's 700 BC, um, began to say that music actually is a way of curing people's illnesses and has a beneficial effect. So as far back as um, 700 BC, people were thinking about this. Were you shocked to learn that people thought about this a long time ago? No, no. In fact, it's remarkable. I mean, there's so much that's, that's, this is why studying history is a really smart thing to do because very little is new, right, in terms of who we are as human beings. But discovering really that, that all, the thing about music is that because it's so powerful in the brain and it takes so many, so, so many kind of processes in the brain, it's, that's what gives it its power. But it's also a, a, an experience that happens in time. So it gives us time to really be in the moment, to really experience the calming effect of music or the, or the effect of music that makes us clean better and get more done or exercise faster. It has a huge effect on us and it's everywhere. So it's the elephant in the room really. And, and using it now because of research and because of technology, which can look at the brain while we're doing these activities, gives us the opportunity to use it in, in a therapeutic manner. Now you had your brain looked at through some kind of MRI scan that was pointed out in the book, and it said that your brain got more excited when you were thinking about music as opposed to actually performing it. Is that yeah. right? It was, it, more parts of my brain were activated by imagining singing than speaking or singing which was really interesting. The scientists were surprised. And finally, they said, oh, right, you're a singer. So the singing part would be easy for you. But you know, one of us who had to do that experiment, experiment it might be a little bit different. So uh, when young children go to school, they're very often by the third or fourth grade told to uh, you know, maybe learn a musical instrument. And it says in the book that um, you can look at the brain, part of the brain of a young child who has um, had um, some musical training at the beginning, and you can see that some part of his, his or her brain is more um, expansive because of the training you get. So, and that's why I think a lot of countries, people, their parents want to get their children to learn a musical instrument. Now, my mother, because my last name was Rubenstein, said, you should learn the piano, but uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, <laughs> piano teacher said, uh, save your money. Uh, there's, no, there's, there's, no, there's no musical talent there. But um, so people who get musical talent early, early on, you know, that's a very important part of their life. It makes them happier, presumably. And, and, but what you've talked about a bit, a bit in the book is people that have illnesses get illnesses cured more readily uh, by listening to music. So for example, you point out that uh, people that have dementia, people that have right. uh, um, uh, post-stress uh, syndrome. PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. Uh, Parkinson's. Parkinson's, Parkinson's particularly. Yes. Um, so how, how does that work where you, 
your brain is saying, all of a sudden, I'm going to be excited because music's coming in. Why? Does anybody no, understand that? They're all different. So music is the last uh, kind of alive part of a person with advanced dementia or Alzheimer's disease to go. So I, I saw this with my husband's aunt, and she could sing the words and lyrics to a number of songs and didn't know the people around her and could not speak. So this, in plasticity of the brain is another way we're learning about this. So the, the singing part of the brain is not the same as the speech. So now, if you have a stroke, for instance, and have aphasia, you can have one session with a the music therapist and regain speech by singing. I mean, it's, a, it's not a, you know, very complicated, but it works, and most people don't know about it. So there are, you point out in the book, there are people at major hospitals now who are musical therapists who go in to patients that have serious problems and they kind of either get them to get involved in music or have music performed or maybe get them to sing. Is that now becoming more common? Well, the musical therapy, music therapists are actually uh, board certified, um, highly trained. Most of them have master's degrees and they are, have, are trained in interventions that are very specific. So the one I just spoke about, you know, an, uh, a nonverbal autistic child can learn speech through that same method. It's called melodic intonation. Um, for Parkinson's, it's really just listening to music using rhythm and audiation, which is imagining music, would enable you to, to move freely without shuffling or freezing, which is remarkable. But so there are, a, a, those are specific things, but if you go into a hospital and there's an orchestra playing or someone's playing the piano, that's, we call that music medicine, and that is a way of, of really helping people relax and reducing anxiety in the caregivers and the families. So a number of the articles point out that people um, have greater happiness when they're performing music in a chorus. In other words, if you're a singer and you don't get quite as the same degree of happiness or health benefits as, as if you are in a chorus, why is that? Be, why would that be? So we're learning a lot about singing now. So singing can improve, car improve cardiac health. It, it, it improves vascular health because for people who are very sedentary and who have that, that, the disease, they're, this is a athletic for them. It's, it's exercise. So they've gotten a huge grant actually to continue the study. Jacqueline Kalinske, she's a beautiful chapter in there. Um, but it's, it's singing, singing in a choir definitely improves your immune system. Think about how social it is also. And now we know that our brain waves align when we're singing together. But my favorite latest research is for postpartum depression. So there was a study in the UK that found if you have postpartum depression and join a choir, you're much better. If you have really bad postpartum depression and join a choir, it helps you even more. So that surprised me. I did not expect for singing at all to be that useful. So it is often said by some doctors that if you want to thwart the possible onset of dementia or Alzheimer's, you can do several things. One is learn a foreign language, which is hard for me to do, um, or if you can um, exercise more, also hard, um, <laughs> learn a musical instrument, or do crossword puzzles. So I'm not good at any of that, but I, if I said I wanted to learn a musical instrument at my advanced age, uh, is it really easy to do now? Can you learn a musical instrument, or can you really perform at a you know, can you learn to sing easier, more easily than play the, uh, play the piano or something? You can have fun with it. You can really enjoy it. You can get better at it. If you like music, and it doesn't matter what kind of music you like, that's the other thing. It's, this is not classical music. It's whatever you like. It's all taste-based. Um, and that's true for any of these interventions. But yeah, absolutely. And think about it. When you're, when you're playing an instrument, you're using motor skill, you have to listen, you have to read the page and translate the page. That's a very complex activity for the brain and body to perform. It's very good for health. In the book, it also points out that throughout history, uh, at funerals or celebrations of death, you have music. And why is it that music is thought to be a good thing to have at a celebration or a memorial ceremony? So throughout history, music and the arts have given us social cohesion. We are clearly a very tribal uh, being, and which is not voting is not going well for us in the world today. But <laughs> but in the past, it's what enabled us to cooperate with each other and to stay together. So music was drumming, singing, chanting. All of these activities, artistic activities, were part of what kept us together. So. It, music has been used for mostly, mostly for kind of somber periods right. of time. I've, I've sung, I sang at 9-11 on site a month after the attack. And I'm, I'll never forget that, that to look out at a sea of 9,000 people who were families. 
of people who are lost. So this is the type of event where we wanted music to bring us together. Okay.